Good evening, everyone. My name is Ian McMillan, and welcome to Optimal Corneal Disease Management, presented by Dr. Paul Karpecki. Conan Medical is a small business based in Irvine, California, and we employ 30 people. In March, when COVID shut down the economy, Conan made a commitment to our employees to maintain our headcount, and we continue to do so today. I know that everyone here is looking forward to getting back to something that resembles normal, and at the same time, grateful that we are all part of an essential, robust, and dynamic industry. We are all being forced to adapt to a new way of doing business in order to survive, and increasing our virtual presence is part of that strategy. So I wanna thank everyone for being here. The tremendous response to this subject and our speaker is truly gratifying. I hope that everyone emerges from this pandemic stronger and maybe even a little wiser than before. Before we get started, as usual, everyone's microphones are muted, but you can send us questions at any time and we'll answer as many as we can at the end of the presentation. For many of you, our speaker today needs no introduction, but just in case, he is the clinical director at the Kentucky Eye Institute, the medical director of Kepler Vision, chief clinical editor for the Review of Optometry and associate professor at the Kentucky College of Optometry. Dr. Karpecki, welcome and thank you for being here. Thanks, Ian. What a wonderful introduction. I, you just summed it up perfectly. You know, we really are in a time that we're all hoping for normalcy, but I also admire, you know, the, the fact that we have over 100 doctors plus, you know, realizing that this is also an opportunity to advance, to learn, to, to come out stronger. And, and I've been amazed by our profession's response. It's extremely exciting to see it bodes well for, for our entire profession. It shows that you know, we, we really are resilient and also we'll use this to, to come out and hit. A few you know, years from now, we'll look back at this as being historic, but it's difficult when we're all in it. Um, I just started going back to clinic this week. So this is my first week back. And um, you know, it, is, it is definitely different than it's been before. My volume was down about 40% or more, um, but it also felt good to have some level of normalcy returning. Uh, this really is a good title, Optimal Corneal Disease Management, because this is working at the highest level. I didn't want to come across and say, you know, this is an absolute standard for primary care optometry. This is really more for optimal care. This is for those who have the best contact lens practices, for those who co-manage in the area of, of refractive, more so cataract surgery and lens-based refractive surgery procedures, and those who have a practice where they see a fair amount of cornea. And so to have this number of people really says a lot, as I talked about. So I'm going to keep this pretty light as we go through it. And a lot of this might be review, but I think it's real important for setting the stage of where we're going uh, with understanding specular microscopy and understanding the important role of the endothelium. Uh, the fact is that the endothelium is a single layer. And the reason why that's so important is that if you think about the epithelium, where you have multiple layers up to 50 microns in thickness, there's the ability for that to spread over top of each other and form in and build up on top. And then eventually you fill in that area where you'd have an abrasion. We don't have that luxury when it comes to the endothelium. The endothelium being just one layer in the back of the cornea is forced to, to spread out as things get to be more difficult. If they lose cells, they have to become larger or change their shape from the optimal hexagonal, uh, a tech, a hexagonal shape that they're known to be in. And so this is more part of that entire uh, key thing. And if you look at the endothelium, its main role is, is to keep the cornea transparent and clear. It's, a, its physiological function is to pump out fluids, but also at the same time to, to allow nutrients from the aqueous humor to the more superficial layers of the cornea. So without the endothelium, we would have an incredibly cloudy eye. And that's exactly what we happens when we see endothelial uh, dysfunction of any level is this clouding, edema, folds and desimase, et cetera. And it's amazing. I'm always fascinated when I look at, you know, the eye. And I, I'm so glad we are in this field because it really, for me, is such an incredible organ. But you think about also even just one component of it, the, the entire cornea maintaining hydration at exactly 78% water. That's the key. Anything higher than that is swelling and edema and haze and difficulty maintaining it. Anything significantly lower uh, results in, obviously, this kind of th thinning type effect or a loss of tissue roll or actually even a condensation effect. So we have to have this normal thickness, both from clarity and from refraction. Any failure of that is also known as bolus keratopathy. In fact, we go back to 1982. 
George Waring, uh, not the fifth right now, the fourth, the other George Waring, who was passed, but a great man, uh, in his publication looking at the endothelium and function back in, in Ophthalmology Journal 1982, shows that with a, gr with a great uh, illustration. And we can't really see it by looking with our slit lamp. This is something that's become incredibly apparent to me. And I know I'm in a cornea practice and I'm seeing patients that I have to be referred in, but I also see regular patients at Gaddy Eye Centers and uh, even in the office in Indiana. Although that's mainly more ocular surface related, I still get a lot of cornea that comes in. And I realize there's such a need for seeing more than we see with slit lamp examination. What, what we're missing is that the cornea can look exactly the same and have maybe one guttata that we pick up, but it's difficult to see until it gets to a certain level of density. So here we have the perfect example where the cornea is clear, likely 78% water content, normal thickness, and yet you can have either one of these appearances that show up. Normal healthy endothelium on the right, that's magnified about 240 times, by the way, if you want it just for trivia. And then the extent of wear contact lens patient, including what we call polymegathism. And basically mega means size. So polymegathism means that some of the cells are much bigger or larger than they should be, um, as opposed to what you see on the right, where they're all the exact same size. And that's why, so I always remember mega as in change in size to be able to remember what that means. And what that is, is an indicator of stress on the endothelium. The endothelium doesn't all of a sudden go from completely normal, as you see on the right, to completely gone with tons of guttata. It, there's a stress point in between where the cells either become different sizes, which is polymegathism, or different shapes, which is polymorphism. So there's what we can see. So the, I love the one on the upper left, uh, because you look at that and you think, well, that is really fairly unique. Patients who've had a history of, especially recurrent or recalcitrant forms of anterior uveitis, will get these. And what these are, are these dark structures that get, they dislodge the endothelial cells. Um, you can see them in the center of the images very well. And I've come to realize this is quite common in patients. And what I love about this is if I have a person who's diagnosed with iritis and uveitis, and my way of knowing when I have to order lab testing and to see if there's a systemic component, because if you don't realize that's present, the patient will continue to have these bouts. And we wonder, why are they still getting them? So to know when to order lab testing, I don't order lab work. I know some people think that it makes sense to order on every uveitis. And there's places where that might make sense. But in general practice, I think you're probably going to order it if it's recurrent, bilateral, or severe presentation, such as hypopion, severe synechiae, keratic precipitates on the cornea, on the endothelium. But the only way sometimes to know, I've had a patient come in and say, I think this is the first time I've ever had this. I don't remember being in this kind of pain and photophobia. And then we looked at the endothelium and it probably indicated, because it was in the other eye, the same pattern, meaning not only did this patient have it in that eye, they had it in the other eye, making it bilateral. We ended up ordering lab testing and it turned out to be positive for Crohn's disease. So it's wonderful to get to be almost a detective doctor and having the tools. But you're gonna see as we go along, there's much more practical applications to specular microscopy. If you look in the lower, it's something that you already know, which is guttata. Guttata, we're gonna go into what exactly that is. Um, as you look to the right of the image, so it's not just looking at the image and seeing. Uh, obviously, in the upper right hand, you have a perfectly normal corneal endothelium. But it's looking to the right of that. <clears throat> I love the bar graph, and I'm going to go into that later. But just suffice to say, as you look on the top, it tells you what percentage of the cells are six-sided, which is the optimal way we were born. All of our cells were hexagonal. <clears throat> and the lower part of the bar, it tells you overall size. There's your polymorphism, polymegathism. You also have cell density, pachymetry, the amount of variability amongst the cells, and the number of cells or percentage that's hexagonal. So tons of information not only show you advanced, like you might have in the bottom right hand, which is obviously Fuchs dystrophy, but also are you moving in that direction? And that becomes critical to managing these patients extremely effectively. So if you look at the bottom, not the far right, but the bottom right of the four, you're going to see, you know, corneal density uh, our, our overall density levels, and this is per square millimeter, so it's over a certain specific area of only 1481. That's obviously extremely low. That's indicating uh, likelihood of Fuchs. We see the guttata present. We also see that we're starting to have structural changes across the board. Ideally, in a good, healthy person, um, that bar graph, that small little bar graph, and again, I'll show you this in a better image later, tends to be skewed over towards the left, except for where you see six-sided. That should be all in a row. And then over the right, this is an interesting one. It's a patient who didn't know they had any problems. 55-year-old <clears throat> lady, 
30 year history of hard lenses, started with PMMA many, many years ago, moved over to RGPs. Look at the abnormal rate of polymegathism that's present. Uh, where you see CV, that's the variability, 63%. That's an incredible amount of variability. That means you're just not seeing the normal sided type uh, pay of, of cells and then our, our size of cells. And then when you look at polymorphism, which is your hexagonal, you can also see that's extremely a low percentage. And so you get a really good idea of what stage of the rat. Talk about a wonderful tool for educating contact lens wearing patients to be able to understand why they should be in a higher level lens, maybe a daily disposable modality, a higher quality lens, uh, good uh, DK, et cetera. So here's another example. Is this normal or pathology? Well, if I were to look at it with a slit lamp, um, I think I'd have a tough time knowing. Um, and what you're seeing there is the patient on the left micrograph, but in the, in the left eye and on the right eye, you can see to the side to the right of it. Um, if you looked at both corneas, they would look identical. You'd never be able to tell. Um, you know, as looking at them, trying to find anything being present. You might see, perhaps if you looked real closely, had high magnification, might pick up on a guttata. But as a whole, what we looking at the difference in the two eyes really kind of helps us. That right eye is extremely stressed. We could tell that by the amount of variability at 50%. That means 50% of the cells are not the right size. And then 36% are hexagonal. That means we're really deficient in that level too. The amount should be much higher of a percentage. Over 60 would be ideal. And if you look at the, uh, or at least over 50%, minimum 40. If you look at the left eye, although you got the same corneal density, so to speak, we've got nice corneal variability and hexagonal shape is above 51%, which is now above that normal kind of range. This turned out, in most cases, I've seen the exact same thing happen in patients where there may be a monocular contact lens wear patient, monovision. And not from every lens where patients are compliant, patients do it as opposed to they don't tend to show a lot of changes, but you do have patients who may overwear them who, or who used to wear hard lenses, PMMA as we showed earlier, all those can kind of lead to it, or it could be the asymmetric presentation of Fuchs and we'll follow the patient to be able to determine what's going on. So the question is why is specular microscopy important? I mean, you guys are here on a very focused uh, webinar, which is wonderful because not only is it, it understanding a lot of how the cornea works and, and disease processes, we're focusing on one specific layer. So the question comes in, you know, why is that important? Well, it's the only way you could view the endothelium on a high magnification. Keep in mind, this is a single cell. So you can't say, well, maybe the cells behind it are fine or anything. This is giving you the entire picture. You're, where this is extremely valuable is in a patient who is, you know, preoperative. That is, they're looking at cataract surgery, especially if they're going to do a premium IOL or refractive lens exchange something where they're paying an extra 5,000, whatever it might be to get these IOLs, you know, to help them uh, see better at near and far. And the last thing you'd want is to have decompensation of the cornea. And that's a common event is after, not decompensation, but is endothelial cell loss after cataract surgery. And if they're already compromised, that can accelerate it. <clears throat> you also wanna look at those patients who are at higher risk, low cell density. I'm gonna talk about what normal is in a moment. High polymegathism, that means a lot of cells that are not the normal size, they've gotten really big to spread out. Remember, one layer, the only way it's gonna get coverage is try to spread out, try and change its sh shape, change its size, and eventually you get guttata where you can't get coverage and existing areas come through. Spectrum microscopy can rule out any post-op corneal decompensation and is critical to the end of, to the preoperative assessment of the endothelium to determine who might be a good candidate or not. In our clinic, we often will, you know, in the cornea clinic, do what's called a triple procedure, where we would do the cataracts at the same time as a as a DMAC or a DSEC. We'd have to have endothelial uh, microscopy in order to know which patient goes in that direction. But there's so many more applications. We want to talk about contact lens applications, because I think that's a huge one in corneal applications as a whole. So here's a good example. Um, this patient, 37-year-old gentleman, uh, has had a penetrating keratoplasty in the left eye. Uh, and the right eye. Both eyes have had this 12 years ago in, in the left, so that's why the order is now eight, nine in the right. So there's only a three year time difference between the. He comes in, he's seen an ophthalmologist occasionally, or comes into my clinical, be the optometrist. He's had a specular exam done out of curiosity in spite of having no unusual symptoms and having had a transplant, it makes sense. Because so his CD, that's really important to look at the overall density. 483 in the right eye, 341 in the left. Those are extremely low numbers as I'll show you in a moment. 
Um, he, he results show that low number also is his, his variability, his uh, coefficient of variability is higher in his left eye, meaning there's a lot more cells that are not the right shape or size, I should say. They're, not, they're spreading out more to try and cover. And you can see that by looking at it. You don't get that honeycomb hexagonal. Pachymetry, though, is normal. So if you only had a pachymeter to look at this patient, you'd think, well, that's pretty good in the right eye. Though you get the left eye, 672. So he's at a stage where he does need a DSAC or Desume scraping automated endothelial keratoplasty, where we'll go in and just remove Desumase and endothelium and replace it with cadaver Desumase and endothelium. And the nice thing about that is we keep everything else where it's supposed to be. We just replace that. But, you know, amazingly, the patient was asymptomatic. And if you wait, the reason why it's important is if you wait until that completely decompensates and you get a lot of edema and bullae, your chance of success with edemic goes down or desec. So you really want to do it when the patient's not having symptoms, but is on the way downhill. And so that becomes extremely important in an advanced cornea type practice or even in optometric practice. We're doing so much more medical now as a profession and we have to. If COVID's taught us well, it's taught us a lot of things, but one thing it's really taught us is the importance of medical eye care. You know, the doctors who are on panels were still getting paid between $46 and $128 for doing telemedicine. If you weren't on a medical panel, you, you didn't have that opportunity. But also for when we go back, the opportunity to just see more of these patients and understand how to manage them effectively so that their entire family comes into your clinic uh, for all their needs. <clears throat> Why is it important? Well, we talked about the preoperative assessment of endothelial cells, but it's the number one predictor of who's going to do well afterwards. So if they're doing a premium IOL, spending all that money, you want to make sure they're going to be successful. I wouldn't want a patient going in there who had a cell count of 1,100. That seems pretty good. It's not good going into cataract surgery or 1,300 even, depending on their age if they're in their 50s. A clear cornea uh, does not rule out low endothelial cell density, as we showed from all those images. You can look at all kinds of slit lamps, and I consider myself to be a pretty good cornea doc. I can look at the cornea under the slit lamp, have a pretty good idea of what's going on. I'm always amazed at how little I know when I start looking at specular microscopy and saying, wow, that looked normal. Look at that cell density. And yes, I saw the odd guttata, but I didn't think it was going to be like this. So normal corneal thickness does not rule out a low cell count. Pachymetry won't give you the answer until it gets advanced. So this becomes an essential tool if you happen to work in, in a number of areas, but three in particular, if you're co-managing. And the reason why this is so critical is that um, when we're doing refractive cataract surgery options, these are patients who, you know, maybe they're in their 50s and they came in for a LASIK and we, we talked and we met with them and said, well, you've got some lens changes. We'd be better off replacing your lens. Um, and, and you'll have, of course, we're doing it before it's covered by Medicare, so you'll pay for it. That's the downside, but you'll be able to see near far, and you wouldn't want to have LASIK and then come turn around a few months later, a few years later, I should say, and then have a cataract surgery because it's more difficult to figure out the IOL and why do we do both procedures when we could have kept your cornea in its normal prolate shape. Well, that's a, a good approach and these patients will pay for it, but I would hate to do it and then find out they start to lose endothelium afterwards. So that group of patients is critical. Plus, we offer pretty good co-management for those patients who are not covered by Medicare. Medicare already dictates your co-management there. But if it's not covered, um, we have the ability to give, you know, our um, ratio, not over 20%, but I mean, it's, you know, it's $1,200 an eye. It gets very significant. Um, but we have to have two things. One, uh, my colleagues, my optometric colleagues have to be able to uh, see the patient for all their visits, which most of them do and do very well, and have to have uh, the ability, so three things, to, to know about these premium myo wells and to explain it to patients effectively and to be able to know what to expect after and, and follow them carefully. And the last thing is to have advanced technologies. That completely justifies that amount. Um, so this is one of those advanced technologies you'd want to have. Contact lens wearers, the best contact lens practice in the country will all tell you that they rely on specular microscopy. And I agree with that. Imagine how easy it is to tell a patient you should be in this higher end daily disposable contact lens without having any evidence, without being able to show them the reason why. If I were to show them that their specular uh, microscopy and their cell density was lower than average, or there was more variability, or there was not enough cells that were hexagonal, all of those we know can get damaged by poor contact lens wear or not the right decay or overwear. 
I have all that I need to be able to explain, hey, here's why you want to be uh, in these proper uh, type of lenses and to wear them on a very good schedule. And then, of course, corneal disease, which will go through many of those, whether it be uveitis and knowing who to order tests from or even from a diagnostic standpoint to a number of other diseases that play a role, ranging from eye syndromes to Fuchs dystrophy uh, all across the board, and even just overall in patients who have any level of edema to kind of rule out what might be going on. And here's the clinical applications. It starts with edema, endothelial dystrophies, pre and post cataract and ocular surgeries, especially now with mixed procedures and glaucoma shunts. We saw a few years ago the Cypass was pulled from the market. Everybody didn't know why that was? Well, it caused endothelial loss. And as they were able to look at this, they found the percentage of patients was approaching 11, 18 percent. You know, fortunately, you know, the new technologies, especially the really good ones like the Hydrus, are not showing that. But but I love to be able to just know that we're watching that and, and following them. But even to four years, they're not showing that type of a change with the Cypass. But we want to be able to monitor that patient before and after to know if they are a good candidate or how they might do afterwards. Phacic IOL is like an ICL. Still, for, in my opinion, the, the best procedure for high myopia or hyperopia. Uh, you don't affect the corneas, natural prolate shape, uh, patients see incredibly quickly and well, and you have the ability to remove it later on. But if they don't have a good endothelium, that would be a disaster. Um, premium lenses we talked about, transplant patients, secondary lens implantation, uh, any eye injury, anyone who has a chemical burn, it, it eventually these endothelial cells had to pull out so much of the edema from that injury that they get stressed and stress causes polymegathism or polymorphism or eventually loss of cells. You would want to know the level um, that that happens. Diagnosed treatment for contact lens induced disorders, even just long standing contact lens wears. It's so fascinating to get the image and to be able to show them kind of what's going on and why we have to adhere to these you know, no more of one month lenses. We've got to get you in a daily disposable. And patients are very adherent when they see why. Um, disorders of the iris ciliary body from uveitis to other developments that happen. And anybody who's like on a long-term glaucoma medication, uh, especially prostaglandins, which I know are the most common, uh, typically are ones where I want to look at their endothelium over time. Not every time they come in for a visit, but maybe every once a year, and then maybe every one to two years after that, depending on what changes. I like to follow them yearly. And then if it's looking fairly consistent, that is the 1% loss every year, then I could follow them a little longer. So the analysis is more than just looking at missing areas. It's looking at cell density. It's looking at what we talked about mega. Remember the word mega? This is how I always remembered it. Mega means size. One's a lot bigger, they're mega, one's smaller. Um, shape is morphing, morphing into a different shape. Instead of being that optimal hexagonal six-sided, it is morphed into four-sided or three-sided, whatever. Uh, corneal thickness is a key, which is all part of the spectrum microscopy. And then the overall morphological appearance. And you can see even looking to the right, the differences in the size and what shape and what you're seeing are so different from a morphological appearance. So I would, when you get a specular, you have one and you're just wanting to learn more about your equipment, you want to have this thing on the right um, in, your, in your lanes, in the drawer. Uh, laminated or otherwise, your endothelial cell density by age. And you'll notice that I put it in a lot of slides because I rely on it myself. I pull it out and I look at it. And so I look at the patient and I say, okay, you're 40 to 49. You should be between 2300 and 3100 cells. Very good estimate. What's really interesting about this is that age is not in of itself an adequate indicator of the normal cell density. Yes, we do see a range of decrease, but it's a large range. And we do see that normal eye should lose about half percentage of cells per year, meaning that if that's all you lost, based on what you started with around 3,500 cells per millimeter squared, you should live to about 200 before you've decompensated your endothelium. If you're losing at 1%, it'd be 100 years. At 2%, only 50. At 3%, 33. And that's why um, the Cypass, that MIGS procedure, that was a shunt that went into the endothelium, when it started getting up above three to five to seven to 11%, we, the FDA knew they had to say, okay, this is coming off the market. Um, that's the scale they also use. We can also use that to kind of look and see where patients are at, how they're progressing, what has changed from time to time. It's a simple calculation. But density, although important, isn't in of itself enough. You also have to look at, at the overall health of the endothelium. So here, look at this two examples. The patient on your left, and again, it's a schematic, but normal cell count, 2,500 cells per millimeter squared. On the right, same thing. But look at the coefficient of variability. 
That is how many of these cells are the right size. 10%, that's wonderful, that's a great number. I love seeing that number under 40, you know, great to be in that category, patients are gonna do well. On the right, variability, 79%. That means only about 30, 20%, 21% are even what they're supposed to be in size. Obviously that patient on the right has either overworn lenses or has had other pathology going on or something has happened. It's caused that stress and we need to act on that right away in terms of what they're using. If it's contact lens, we need to adjust. If it's a type of glaucoma med, we might probably need to change it. On the left, 100%, that's a little extreme, but it happens. 100% are hexagonal, that would be a very young patient usually, but um, you know, if you got anything that's in that appropriation, somewhere around 60% or more, I'm feeling really good about that. Even as low as 40% to 50, 50% is a good number of where I wanna be. I don't wanna see 25 though, that's way too much variability. The cells are most effective at pumping out fluid and edema when they are six-sided. So if only 25% of them are, that's way too much, and that's pleomorphism. Again, morphs into a different uh, shape, or mega becomes much bigger or smaller in size. So what happens with natural aging? Well, if you look at this patient, again, he's at the high end of the range, 10 to 19, 3,600 cells per millimeter squared. Uh, by age 40 to 49, drops to 2850, 80 to 89, 1850. Really wonderful looking endothelium. Post cataract drops to 883. That does happen way more often than you think, especially in a complex cataract. If this patient was, let's say, 88, very dense nuclear sclerotic cataract, a lot of time in there and energy when they're doing the surgery, that is not an uncommon loss. That's such a key component. That's why we check it so closely before they go into surgery. That's why you justify your co-management fees at a higher level because you're ensuring that patient's corneal health because they are going to drop maybe not to this level, but every one of them, depending on the amount of surgery and trauma, has a drop in endothelium, typically. Post-surgical cell loss, 623, as that goes on. So we really can tell us a lot about the normal. This is a pretty typical pattern of life of an endothelial cell, uh, of the cell sheep, so to speak. So the first question is, what's Gutata? A lot of people think, you know, different things of this. I also had different things in my mind of what this was when I was doing my cornea fellowship, but it's a droplet-like accumulation of non-banded collagen. It's on that posterior surface of desimase that pushes in that direction. So that, and you can see that coming up through the endothelium in your images on the right. Now, here's what's really interesting is that it's extremely common. 70% of the population over 40 have gute. 70%. So in of itself, and this is gonna be a really important one, I show you one of my cases in a moment. Um, it's not an indication of Fuchs by any means. These are normal. You don't have 70% of the population developing Fuchs dystrophy. The incidence increases with previous eye diseases, previous surgeries. Uh, there's usually no effect on vision in of itself and no clinically significant corneal edema. Once you start to get clinically significant corneal edema, then you might be thinking Fuchs dystrophy, but Gutata in of itself is not pathological in of itself until it shows other signs or it advances to a level where other signs show up. On contrast is Fuchs endothelial dystrophy. This is caused by deteriorating corneal cells and this can lead obviously to clinically significant corneal edema because they are not able to pump out the fluid when they want. Does anybody know when the symptoms are worse? When it's truly, when you're thinking of Fuchs, I, let me rephrase that. Let me know what symptom is one of the most common symptoms you're gonna see in making a diagnosis of Fuchs dystrophy. A lot of people will say halos, glare at night, and that's correct. But the, for me, the real critical symptom that makes a diagnosis of Fuchs is blur in the morning. Uh, because think about it, our cornea swells overnight. So when we wake up in the morning, it has to pull that out. And it takes a long time because the endothelial cells are not healthy or missing or extremely stressed in terms of polymegathism and pleomorphism. So we, are, we get that morning blur. It could maybe at the beginning it last 30 minutes. Now, as it goes past an hour, hour and a half, two hours, that's a dystrophy, that's a Fuchs that needs a DSAC or a DMAC. And that's how you know when to send the patient in for surgery and allows you to follow that patient and to bill and to do the medical exam and to bill for the specular and all the things that go along with that until it's the right time. Now, you don't want to wait until it's decompensated. That's not as good of a surgery, but you also don't want to send them in when they have no morning blur. Uh, they're just not at a stage that are going to need it. Likewise, while doing pachymetry at the same time, I usually wait till it gets above 600. Now, some people naturally have a 600 micron cornea. So it also has to, you have to look at what the baseline is. That's why a specular is so critical because sometimes you don't even know what the baseline pachymetry is.
So what percentage of the population develops Fuchs? It's quite significant. It's 4%. That's a huge number if you think about population. Uh, glaucoma, which is very important that we treat, is 2.7% of the population over age 40. So we this is a bigger opportunity technically than most diseases that we think of that are big. So if you look at over age 40, that's the number at 4%. The endothelial cells gradually malfunction, so you have quite a bit of time while only 2% of the patient above age 40 affected by glaucoma. 2.7% above age 60, by the way, 2%, 2.1, 2.2 over age 40. Endothelial pump sites decrease, um, and then you're not able to get the effects and you get that morning blur. As it advances, you also get halos and the symptoms at night. Well, there's a great little intro. Let's do a few cases, and then we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the overall understanding this type of specular microscope from Conan and then understanding um, you know, where this all fits in and how it might apply clinically. And then we'll go through some questions and answers at the end, which will be fun. A uh, 62-year-old patient showing up in your office as you're getting back in the clinic. And really, if we're only gonna see 40% like my clinic of what I used to see, I wanna be seeing the patients with the most medical disease. They're gonna pay more. I'm gonna be able to test appropriately more. Uh, this is what I want in my clinic as I go forward. I know I can't choose all of them, but this is where I can, by technology and by reputation, get more of these patients, and all of you can too. It's no different. 62-year-old lady complains of blurred vision in the morning, one eye more than the other. It is not uncommon to have asymmetric development of conditions like Fuchs dystrophy. Interesting enough, halos at night and nighttime driving, but notice the chief complaint was blurred vision in the morning. That's the big trigger for me when I start thinking about Fuchs dystrophy. It's been getting worse, especially in the last year after cataract surgery. So here was the time when the surgeon or the co-managing optometrist didn't have specular and just missed that capability. And uh, would have been a great time to consider doing both or to do the DSEC or to know to do it right afterwards. Either way, DSECs are wonderful procedures because you don't have to remove epithelium, you know, Bowman's, stroma. Uh, and if it's a DMEC, you don't even have to remove desimase. So you're rest just removing the one layer that's damaged. So you can technically do it any time, but it'd be nice for the patient to know that <clears throat> they had a premium eye well, they would be very upset that it didn't even last a year. They'd be blaming you and me and the surgeon and everyone. So no pain. Foreign body sensation is not present. The reason I put that one down, because I could have put down anything there, you know, uh, as another symptom, is because foreign body sensation starts to show up when you get corneal edema in these patients. So if it's a really an advanced case, they may mention foreign body sensation because of the folds and desmase, the edema that's taking place in the stroma, and they're just kind of aware of it because it's so edematous. So hence the reason I isolated that symptom out of the ones that might be there. In the case of this patient, um, we're seeing significant vision loss because 2050 minus is, is their best corrected visual acuity. That's a pretty significant drop because remember it's post cataract. We're hoping after cataracts are correctable to 2020 or whatever their capability is. Glare testing, which just happened to be done, I guess, looking at, at from the ahead of time, maybe they're looking at the back of the IOL for glare testing as well with PCO. But 2080, uh, we did our eye kinetics on pupils, normal EOMs, uh, confrontational fields were all normal, pressures of 14. So that was all fine. But slit lamp was taken in the morning. I love seeing potential Fuchs patients in the morning because you get to see them at their worst. <clears throat> I've had patients who look like this in the morning and look almost normal other than the guttata you're seeing there as far as an edema standpoint and folds later in the day it can change that much uh, depending on what stage they're at so you can see the folds you can see the edema and you can also see the guttata that's present so when they get this advanced you're going to see it on slit lamp but still i want to know how long the morning blur lasts if it's more than an hour and packs are above 600 if it's more than two hours they pretty much need a procedure how debilitating is it you make decisions on the based on the time of the day, the patient presentation, the pachyometry, and especially the specular microscopy. Here's another example. This patient RRD, 2100 in the morning, functional the rest of the day, especially later in the day, like after about 10, he said, man, at that point I could go back to work, things are fine, but I understand why I cannot see anything in the morning for the first two or three hours, ended up requiring a DSEC at the time. Here's our patient again from another angle. You can definitely, definitely see the edema, taken in the morning helps us to know. Um, later in the day, it could be difficult. Here's a patient where we are seeing that, seeing that beaten bronze look on the endothelium, but 
but it's only when we look at the specular to the right, we really realize the level of what's going on for this patient. Uh, so, uh, the d density uh, is at 1600 roughly. You're seeing just overall incredible amount of guttata. The cells that are there, but few are there, are really pretty healthy, but you see all the breakdown in between. You see there's very few that are of the normal six-sided and not the right size as well. So it tells us a significant amount. So what could you do? Well, I mean, if I catch it early, I could use hyperosmotics like mural ointment, mural drops. I don't know how much they slow it down, but patients will tell me it helps a little. So that's enough for me to say, okay, let's, especially at the beginning, maybe it takes a little of the strain off the endothelium overnight. So mural ointment plays a role. During the daytime, I have a little bit of a quandary because mural drops do burn. Uh, the ointment doesn't, which is surprising because the ointment's 5%, the drops are 2%. A salt solution or sodium chloride. So I tend to like fresh coat. It pulls about 110 millimeters of oncotic pressure, so it helps those patients, but it's much more comfortable. So mural ointment at night, fresh coat during the day. If they're moderately or more advanced, I'm not sure this does much, but if you catch them earlier, it does help. In this case, we really had to look at a DMEC, a DSEC or an automated DSEC. So these were our options. I like DMEC the best, but it really depends on the patient, what kind of tissue we're able to get. So keep in mind, when you're monitoring these patients for Fuchs, and it's 4% of the population over 40, look for morning blur that clears over the day. If it's persistent for more than one to two hours, consider surgical options. If it gets to the point of intermittent foreign body sensation, that's edematous related, and that tells you they probably are advanced. Look for signs of thickening, decreased endothelial cell counts or density, increased pachymetry, like this patient surpassed 600, and then of course, specular guttata and endothelial changes on slit lamp. This patient went on to have, in this case, it's a DSEC because of the time when it was done as the case I have and have. And you can tell everything looks good. The gas bubble's in there. We have the new endothelium push right up against the back. Here's a little later on next day, it's starting to fade away or two days out. And then the patient, same eye, it's just harder to tell, but same eye here, um, you know, a month later, perfectly clear, doing extremely well. And you don't want to let these get to full decompensation. Your success isn't as high. I, I feel like so I, this is a great time to be treating it and really be hard to tell if you're too soon or too late without specular. It's really the ideal test for knowing where the patient's at. Let's do another one. Case of patient SLD. Um, in this case, 36-year-old lady, young lady, moved to Lexington, here for contact lenses. So that wouldn't have seen me. That would have seen my by one of our primary eye care practitioners in our office um, or one of my colleagues who, you know, saw the patient and sent over. Um, she's worn lenses since age 11, and her comment is that she replaces her lenses a few times per year. She's wearing two-week disposable, so a few times per year. That tells us a lot about compliance. Um, her lenses were the, yeah, two-week, so let's say she replaces them twice. That's every six months. She's a little off in her replacement time. She says she wears them all day long, morning till night. Um, she's been wearing them since 11, so she knows she's used to them. But she's noticing slight decrease in wearing time, not a little bit of issues at the end of the day with vision, but no major complaints. So this is a common patient I bet most of you see in your clinic. Vision's great, 2020 plus, 2020 minus one, that's not anything significant. Pupils on eye kinetics were normal. I like that device because it's, it's automated. I, I'm not good at swinging flashlight, nor to be fair, or my staff. We miss, we miss a lot. I had no idea how many we missed till we got the eye kinetics you start realizing a half a level of APD is significant in a glaucoma patient who has an asymmetric glaucoma, which is where many of them start. EOMs were normal confrontation fields. Pressures, fine. Packs, by the way, were fine. I'll show you that. Eye looks good. And you're not really seeing anything. I mean, you're seeing a little bit of a, looks like lenticular issues, but they aren't. It's just the way the light is kind of catching this young patient. A little bit of injection, maybe grade one plus, uh, maybe from some MGD, because I see some telangiectasia in the lower eyelid there, but overall nothing going on, you know, that's just iris you're seeing in there. Staining, well, there's one spot, maybe a little bit of SPK, but nothing outside of a normal contact lens where a good level tear meniscus, grade one meibomian gland dysfunction. So a little, when I expressed the glands, it wasn't a perfect oil, it was a little bit more thickened, but nothing here that alarmed me, osmolarity is normal. So went to specular microscopy, saw immediately, um, you know, that this is not for her age, She's slightly lower. Now, I'm not alarmed. I'm not thinking Fuchs. But I happened to notice as I was doing a slit lamp exam, a place here and there of guttata. 
And you'll notice that on specular, not many, but there's a spot, maybe two. I bet this would be, I probably would have missed this, truly, looking at a patient in most cases. This is very difficult to see that little bit, but here it shows up. And then when I went back to slit lamp and looked at her eyes, well, maybe I could see one or two here. But I'm noticing that her hexagonal count is starting to drop, 46%. Her variability is up to 32%. So, you know, we're getting, you know, where we're getting more variability. But her density, and again, what I tend to do is I pull up my little grading chart. And if she's about 2,400 and she's in her 30s, I go over here and say, well, not bad. You're kind of in the low end of where we needed to be. And that's what it showed. And the field density at the lower end. Her variability was starting to approach abnormal levels. I explained to her her optimal cells would be six-sided, and hers are now showing significant numbers that are no longer six-sided. 20 years ago, they probably were all, most all six-sided. Her pachymetry was 600, which is interesting, but I think that's just her physiological pachymetry. In fact, if I were to go back, you could see it there on her specular, it was about 601, and were no other signs. But you know what this gave me the opportunity to do? Be, and, and rightfully so, when you start to see variability in the size of the cells or in the number that are six-sided, uh, we start having a conversation about, hey, you're fine. I just don't want to let anything continue to advance to where you are going to have more problems at the end of the day, to where you might have problems in the morning, to where we put too much stress on these cells because these cells can't be replaced. They can only spread out. It's all that endothelial cells can do. So we had a nice discussion on daily disposable contact lenses. We discussed wearing time, wearing them no more than about 10 to 12. That's still a good amount of hours per day. Um, we repeated our specular six months later, and it was a little higher in the variability, but no major change. This patient has been very dedicated to practice. She comes in regularly. She understands the need for good quality contact lenses. She does not complain about the cost of lenses. She knows that it's so important to her and their cells. A picture is worth a thousand words. She's compliant. She tells me she wears her lenses 10 to 12 hours, then discards them daily. What a difference from replacing twice a year to discarding them daily. And I really, from looking at her orders and looking at her dedication, she's there. That's the great value. And that's optimal care. If you had a patient going into lenses for the first time and you do specular and you find the variability is, is above 40%, you have a justified reason to recommend the best possible modality and the best possible lenses. And it's not a case of patients not believing you. You're seeing the evidence right there. You're explaining it to them. It's amazing how well this goes for growing a practice. Do you think that patient is going to see any other doctor again for contact lenses and her family and her friends? That's exactly what happens. Let me give you one more case, then we'll go through kind of the final parts here. 56-year-old lady, referring doctor thought it might be Fuchs dystrophy. And the reason why is, and we have good docs in Kentucky. I'm really lucky. I, I would, uh, almost all my patients are referred in from, from colleagues, some ophthalmologists, but mostly from optometry colleagues. And this happens a lot. You look at the eye, you see guttata, and the patient has complaints to go with it. But the patient's complaints were unique. She came in disgruntled. She said her LASIK, which she had done, you know, about 15 years ago, isn't working. It's worn off. I'm very upset with the results. We, I, we didn't do the LASIK. I don't know why she was upset. Can't see up close or distance. Having night vision problems, especially in the left eye. Wants to know what can be done. Isn't happy. And I get those unhappy patients. And that's okay. It, it's a referral clinic. That's what we should get. Thank goodness we have good tools. 2020 minus, 2020 minus two. That's not enough to give me those complaints. Look at her refraction. Plano minus a half. Minus a quarter, minus a quarter. And I got her to 2020. I mean, it was not a lot. I'm thinking, well, that's kind of a okay, but I can see why you can't read. It's not your surgery. It's you were perfect in distance. Your lens is changing. Everything's normal. Pressures are normal. Let's take a look at the slit lamp. Well, what you're seeing there is obviously the slit, the interface LASIK. So that's just, there is something there. And I have to admit, I looked at that, but I didn't get alarmed by it by any means. It's nothing active. Her surgery was 15, 20 years ago. But sometimes you can see the interface like that. There's another able, you can see that interface. See, there's a few little whatever's there, cells, oils, whatever got in there. And maybe that's accounting for a 2020 minus. I don't think that is something new. And it, and it wasn't based on our symptoms and our vision and everything that we're seeing. But that's why tools are so helpful. And the doctor referring the patient in thought it was Fuchs. And I got to give him credit because there was guttata. 
So obviously we're going to do specular and we can see the guttata, even though it's hard to see it on the slit lamp, you can definitely see it when you magnify it 240 times. But the question was, is this Fuchs? Well, asked her if she had morning blur, no. Halos at night though, but no morning blur, no foreign body sensation, no edema, nothing else going on. I didn't happen to examine her in the morning, which is ideal, but I didn't necessarily, we didn't schedule it right, but that's okay. I don't think it was any different. Look at her cell density, 2,800. Again, variability is high, 36%. Um, hexagonal only at 43%. I like that to be well above 50. Um, we are seeing pachymetries that are normal. That's not gonna tell us Fuchs. Look at the number of cells that are six sided at the bottom, that orange little grid, that's pretty good. And we have a skew towards the left, which is what we want when it comes to size. So not bad, but I could see why Fuchs was thought because of the guttata. You can have guttata without pathology of Fuchs. But what's interesting is what do we do with this patient? Well, you're not gonna go back and do another LASIK and lift that up and try and give her a minus 150 monovision. Um, she had above average endothelial cell density. So I'm thinking, hey, you're way above. I mean, look at the patient's 56 and her numbers would be where someone in their 40s should be. I thought, okay, PAX 516. She's noticing some night vision, no morning blur. Gute was definitely noticed. Believe it or not, I had a discussion with this patient. I reassured her that her endothelium was healthy. I told her that the reason why she couldn't read is that her lenses were changing in her eyes. They age as they do in everybody. Now they're no longer accommodating. That happens in your 40s. And in your 50s, you have to turn the lights on a little brighter and you have some problems reading and seeing at night. That's normal with lens changes, not yet a full cataract, but it's then the dysfunctional lens syndrome stage two, they call it sometimes. We ended up having a discussion. She said, well, what could I do refractively? And she said, I'd pay anything. Well, we could do, I shouldn't say at the beginning, I told because she was really upset. She probably want her money back if we did the surgery. I don't know why she came to us because she was referred to me. Patient went on to have a refractive lens exchange. That means she paid the four or $5,000 per eye to have a panoptics or symphony, I think it was at the time, lens put in. The reason I didn't feel like I had to worry is her endothelial cell density was perfect. She had great overall morphology. I've been monitoring her endothelial changes, not seen a change in two years now. She's happy as can be, has sent a bunch of patients over. It all came down to specular microscopy. But Conan is unique. It is the clear advantage. I don't want to say you can buy any specular because I don't think you can. If you don't look in the exact same location, 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 every time for your testing, you could look at something that looks very variable with a complete a different look than the next time if it's not lined up. This location identification, this fixation direction, is not enough. You can't draw conclusions about changes over time unless you know the exact sample location, and only the Conan system does that. It also has trend analysis. So many times, if you're not looking, you want to be able to see what is changing over time. You can definitely tell when it gets a printout that comes in. Multi-point pachymetry. I love this for a lot of things, including keratoconus. I want to see what are the packs above, below, nasal, temporal, what areas I want to look at. If I had a drop in fairly of more than 40 microns, that's probably keratoconus, believe it or not. It does thicken normally in the periphery. If it drops by more than 20 to 40, that's pathological. So it gives you a pretty good idea of what's going on, such as this case here in the patient and clear advantage of what's happening. Um, this is what's been published in over 200 peer reviewed journals is the Conan cell check system, not the, any of the others. It's standard configured with database backup, high resolution, touch screen. Um, I have the one right here. That's the one I've got. Um, other built-in benefits, and I purchased my own. I couldn't practice without a specular like the cell check. It's the only one I would use. Uh, standards for FDA device, drug devices, other built-in benefits, manual photography. You can bill for anterior segmentography, but I bill for specular. IOL, ICL mode, pachymetry, everything there. And even a Vienna study has shown this. He compared four, and this was not sponsored by anybody. This was a independent group. Good publication looked at all the commercially available specular microscopies. 70 plus patients with all kinds of pathologies were included, three images per eye per patient. Conan selectin was the uh, Conan system. The cell check was the most comprehensive of them. Location photography identified most important feature of having data. And if you look at the study specifically, the only thing it said is that the uh, Conan uh, was not as fast as the other, but we're still talking about a minute, minute and a half to get your image. It's not like it's a long time, but it wasn't immediate. It felt the other ones could be fine for a screener, but that's it. You don't want just a screening. 
You want extensive post-processing options. You want exportability. You want the instrument to be suitable for compromised corneas, research purposes, healthy corneas. In fact, even in the conclusion, they found that careful interpretation of results from Tomei's automated image analysis software uh, was mandatory because you couldn't do it by their results. With the specular, uh, by the cell check from Conan, you do have that automatically. And the reason for that is that the cell check takes into account the contour of the cornea, doesn't take a flat image. So you're getting an exact measurement of what's going on. And that really is a separator. You know, um, before I take questions, I do want to compliment uh, Ian and, and Conan. And one, for putting things on like this during this time. We're all hopefully learning new things, advanced things, building a practice in the future that will be even stronger and better. But I also compliment the company. They remind me of like Macintosh or Apple. You know, Macs never really invented the stuff from the beginning in all cases, meaning they didn't come up with the first music M-Pod. They just made a better one. They didn't come up with the first tablet, but they've got a better one. They didn't come up with the first operating system, but one of the best. They didn't come up with any of their iPhones first. There were electric phones way before them, but they came out with stuff and made it better. And Conan, to me, does that too. Whether it's Color DX, which you can build for, iKinetics, which is a phenomenal way to be able to measure uh, pupil, re relative afferent pupillary defect, pupil size, all the pupil testing, the pearl essentially, whether it's Evoke DX, which is your VEPs, whether it's a objective visual field test, whether it's specular, uh, you can go on and on. It really does, uh, it's a kind of technology they take it to the next level and it does make it easy and accurate for us working in this field. So I do thank them.